came to the motivation that what? I'm so sorry. Came to the conclusion that the motivation for the suspension could have been the investigation. Yes. But she came to the motivation on the basis of inadequate facts. And that is why a court assesses all the facts, not the facts that it draws from a snatch on, as this person had, in good faith, drawn from a snatch on the radio. No doubt what it had heard from the PP's representative or what it had heard. You don't, that's not how a court operates. A court asks the question, what does the reasonable, thoughtful, well-informed observer say? And that person views all of the facts together. That person, Ala van Rooyen, is alive to the fact that there are constraints on the president's power and he can only act when parliament has started its own proceedings and he can only do that. And so that is why I say, and Justice Cheeky, go back to your point, the only way you could conclude that there's a problem is if you say the moment the president is being investigated, then he's automatically disqualified from suspending. But that argument is plainly bad. And of course, the truth is that the president had already been investigated for other things and was being investigated, as I've demonstrated to you in part A. And that is the difference with respect. And that's what van Rooyen says. In van Rooyen, what had happened was that the High Court had said, well, the minister has the power to dismiss a magistrate, and every reasonable observer would say, well, now the magistrate is going to kowtow to the state. That, that is probably what people uh, in, in, the, in the public domain might think if they don't have the full facts. But in Van Rooyen, Justice Chaskelson was at pains to say, that's not how the reasonable, thoughtful uh, observer involves. That, that is how the hypersensitive, cynical, and suspicious person reacts. And so when well, we view... Uh, over here. It's, it's, it's not just uh, people in the public domain who focused on, the, on this two-day span. Yes. The quarter core itself uh, did exactly the same. And, uh, yes. That's why you're here now. Uh, wh wh why would it have disregarded, you know, the, the rest of the timeline in your view? With great respect, Deputy Chief Justice, I don't know. Because if you ask Mr. Bishop, he will tell you that I made the same argument in the court. I, quote. I read the same chronology. It's my same set of notes. And it seemed to me, with respect, that that chronology was critical. The court, I quote, drops a reference to it. They say, although we've had regard to the long chronology raised by the DA, we're not persuaded. There is no proper explanation with respect. They appear to be, have been, what, what seems to have happened here, and, and it's the elephant in the room, is that Pala Pala has caused a massive outcry. And so Pala Pala is somehow regarded as different from the uh, Vartikloof investigation or the judicial capture investigation or the Glencore. That seems to have been the elephant in the room in the High Court. But with respect, that can't be right. And it can't be right for another reason. I gave you two examples of where I accepted that there would be an apprehension of bias if the president only started the suspension when he was being investigated or uh, if the president had waited and waited with no reason. Let me give you another example. Suppose there was a showing that the deputy public protector position was vacant and therefore the president, if he suspended, would put an end to the Pala Pala investigation because there was no one to take over. That might give rise to an apprehension of bias. Or suppose there was a showing that the deputy public protector was a stooge of the president. She was the president's cousin or she was the president's friend. Then you could say, well, the president was biased because he opted, instead of an independent investigator, he ended up with someone who was his cousin or his friend. But there is not a word on that. There is not one word in these papers to impugn the credibility of the deputy public protector. And that is why we say, actually, it's a suspension that could never have benefited the president. He is still being investigated, and of course you now know that from the supplementary affidavit put up by the, public, by the, by the acting public protector. So, so, so we submit, when you look at all these things together, there is simply no basis for concluding a reasonable apprehension of bias, and that on that basis alone, the court must simply refuse to confirm the order of the High Court and uphold the appeal. Can I now assume that I have been unsuccessful this morning? Can I assume that my attempts have fallen on deaf ears and that you have decided that the president is biased or is reasonably apprehended of bias? And can I deal with the question of remedy? Well, once we're there, with great respect, I don't care particularly about the president anymore because he's been found to be biased and he's botched it. Uh, I want to talk about what happens next. And what happens next is if this court delivers its judgment tomorrow, does the public protector get back into office the day after? And we submit that could never be an appropriate remedy. It could never be an appropriate remedy because the, the high watermark of the public protector's case is not that the wrong decision was made, 
It's that the decision was made by the wrong person. Now, if this court accepts that, then the remedy is to ensure that the decision is made by the right person. Whether that's the deputy president, whether it's someone delegated by the president, I don't know. But it's got to be made by somebody else. And in the meantime, it would be catastrophic, not just in general, but for the Pala Pala investigation in particular, if the public protector could go back. Can I give you this example? Suppose the court gives judgment tomorrow. Uh, I'm not suggesting you will. But suppose the court gives judgment tomorrow and declares the suspension invalid and says the public protector can go back on Monday. And Deputy President Mabuza then writes and says, all right, give me submissions. It's my decision now. Give me, in two weeks, I'll make a decision. And the submissions come. And he makes a fresh decision in two weeks. Well, one of two things has happened. If in those two weeks the public protector, Advocate Mkabani, has delivered her Pala Pala investigation, you can be guaranteed that the decision will be castigated on the basis that she is a person with the most enormous cloud hanging over her head, judicial pronouncements, the pronouncement of Justice in Kabinde's panel, all the rest. If the public protector starts getting back involved in the investigation and is then suspended, it will just delay the Pala Pala investigation. It cannot be in anyone's interest. Instead, the appropriate route is to do exactly what this court did in McBride. In McBride, you will recall, he too was facing disciplinary hearings. He too was suspended pending the outcome. But this court held, rightly, that the legislation giving the minister that power was unconstitutional. Someone argued for Mr. McBride, that's someone being me, that Mr. McBride should be entitled to get back into office immediately. This court wasn't interested in that submission, quite correctly. It said, there needs to be another chance to get the suspension decision right. And so we're going to declare the statute invalid. We're going to suspend the declaration of invalidity for 30 days, long enough to enable a further decision to be taken on whether Mr. McBride should be suspended. And if that decision is taken, then he will remain suspended. That's what this court did. That case is on all fours with this case, but for one irrelevant factor. That case was about the declaration of invalidity in respect of a statute. This case is about the declaration of invalidity in respect to the conduct of the president. That is a distinction without a difference. But our learned friends in their heads, when we raise McBride, say, well, McBride's distinguishable. Why? Well, I don't know, because the heads don't tell us. Sorry, Mr. Butlander, can I, can I ask you, um, Section 90, Sub 1 says the deputy president must act when the president is absent from the country or unable to fulfill the duties of a president, yes. what would make him unable to fulfill his duties here? Justice Majid, it's a long debate we've had on our team, but the argument would be that he is unable to fulfill the duties of the president because he is biased. Now, there's a difficulty with that because the section appears to contemplate that he's unable to uh, fulfill the duties of the, of the office. In other words, if the president's in a coma, that would apply. This would be different. You would be saying that the president is able to fulfill all of the duties of the office except this one. It doesn't fit comfortably with Section 90, but well, that is how you would have to read it. Well, that's exactly my problem. As far as I know, this sec subsection um, and my knowledge is limited. But as far as I know, it's never been interpreted, at least by this court, uh, as far as I know by the SCA, maybe by a high court. But I thought of... Do you want to take an instruction? <laughs> I don't wait, want to take I'll, an instruction. I'll, I wanted to phone a friend. Um, I'll, I'll wait the, for <laughs> my learned <laughs> junior tells me that it was interpreted by the High Court in Nkasana. But, but when Nkasana came to this court as corruption watch, that issue was not dealt with. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't one of the issues. I looked at that case. Well, as far as my memory serves me, and it's only because I was involved as counsel in a matter, it may not be exactly analogous, but consider this. There's a matter in the SEA, and uh, I must confess that I didn't do my homework properly and look at the case, but I, I remember it was in the SEA, somewhere in the 90s or maybe early 2000s, where an assessor sat, two assessors sat with a judge, being Crew and Jay, in a trial. The assessor's daughter became, she had a terminal illness, but the assessor was told over the weekend that the end is nigh and that he is advised to be at his daughter's bedside. And he was, of course, emotionally and mentally traumatized. The judge called all counsel into chambers, and we all agreed to excuse the assessor, because in terms of the Criminal Procedure Act, we all thought, like the judge did, we agreed, that he was unable to act as an assessor. And so he was excused, and the trial continued. And in the SEA, 
the uh, conviction and sentence were set aside because of that was a fundamental irregularity in the sense that the assessor could have persuaded the judge and the other assessor otherwise on the facts of course only and and therefore the uh, as i say the conviction and sentence were set aside now I, I'm, I'm not saying it's exactly the same no. but uh, it may well be that and my prima facie view is that unable to fill cannot comfortably fit into the scenario that you sketching that because he is biased he is therefore mm -hmm. unable to fill his duties as a president and, and he does bother me thank you justice majid your, your point with great respect has as much force because for two reasons Firstly, what it demonstrates is that our courts take a very strict approach to someone being disqualified from acting. Uh, and, and we would urge that too. If, if, if this court were, for example, to accept the main proposition that whenever the president has a complaint against him, he's out, uh, it would be entirely at odds with that. But the second, point, the second point is that one needs an effective remedy in this case, if you're against me on the merits. If you're with me on the merits, the problem doesn't arise. But one needs an effective remedy. And it's not obvious to me what that effective remedy is. Let's assume the president was biased. Let's just assume that he was biased. If Section 90 doesn't apply, as you've postulated to me and I've demonstrated my difficulties with it, what was the president meant to do? He could have delegated his power to the deputy president, to the minister of justice, but we know what would have happened then. What would have happened then is Advocate Mkwebani would have brought a challenge to say, but when the President designated Mr., uh, um, Minister Lamola or Deputy President Mabuza, he was already biased, and that bias infects the delegation, and therefore the bias problem persists. So with respect, it is a difficult problem, and what it demonstrates is that the Court should not too readily concede that a president, c conclude that a President is biased in these sorts of situations. But the more fundamental point I wish to submit is this. Whatever this court does, if it, up, if it refuses to uphold the appeal on the merits, it cannot leave us in a situation where there is no one who is properly empowered to make the suspension decision, and it cannot leave us in a situation where, pending that decision, Advocate Mkwebani gets back into office. And if that requires this court to use its wide remedial powers under 172 1B, then it must with respect. But it can't be that Advocate Mkhebani has shown the President's bias and is then immune from suspension? Well, the converse of that is that, and I mean it's self-evident as, as the highest court, one must be very careful to set precedent, particularly in a section like this, Section 90 sub 1, it's the highest office in the land, yes. as far as the executive is concerned, to make a finding that for something, and I'm not saying it's a trifling matter, but still, for something like bias, for yes. example, yes. that means that the president becomes unable to fulfill his duties. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a very large step to take. With great uh, respect, in jurisprudence of this court. With great respect, that is correct, and that is why, Justice Majit, when we say the double reasonableness test applies across all contexts, liquor licences, courts, the president. That doesn't mean you apply it in the same way. So deciding that someone who's refusing a liquor license is biased is not a very significant thing in the great scheme of things. There'll be another liquor license inspector. Deciding that the president is biased. I imagine South Africans are all watching out to see what the outcome will be, but uh, we're going to dip in and out. But if you would like to continue to follow this court proceeding live, uh, log on to the SABC News channel, uh, online platforms, uh, and uh, you will find this being live streamed there.